Welcome to Screencast 6 in this eight-part series on Introduction to Spreadsheets. In this video, we're going to expand on what we learned about scatter plots in Screencast 5, learning how to take two-variable data and creating mathematical models of the data that will allow us to analyze the behavior of the data and make predictions about the data that we don't have. So let's return to the example we saw briefly in Screencast 5, where we have the population of South Bend, Indiana over time in 10-year increments. For reasons uh, that I will explain in a little while, we've added a new column here for years since 1870. So time zero is the year 1870, time 10 is 1880, and so on. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is because I want to keep the time value small, so 10 rather than 18, 1880. So let's recreate the scatter plot we saw back in the previous screencast using the new uh, rescaled time data, highlighting everything, going to insert chart. And uh, let's recreate the scatter plot with the smooth curve uh, that we saw connecting the points. Okay, so here we go. Now, what's nice about this is that the scatter plot and the curve that goes to the points, uh, these give us a way to easily change numerical data into a graphical format. And so we get to see things about the data that we didn't necessarily see before. But what would be even nicer if I, is if I could get a formula that traces out this graph. Now, spreadsheets give us a way to do this with a very important tool called a trend line. So let's go back, and I'm just going to delete the curve and just keep the dots here and see how we do this. So first of all, a trend line is a curve. And by curve, it could be a straight line, or it could be the graph of a polynomial, or a power function, or some other kind of function that approximates the shape of the data and gives us the overall trend of behavior that the data show. Now, Excel and many other full-featured spreadsheets will give us the ability to add trend lines to scatter plots. And importantly, you not only get to choose the kind of function you want to add, you also get a formula for that function, as well as a certain kind of statistic that tells us how good the fit is. So let's have a closer look here. So I'm going to go back to the scatter plot I made for population, and I'm going to put the cursor right on top of one of the data points in the plot, so it turns into a little arrow. When I click, all of them light up. I'm going to right click now and I'll see a context menu that has add trend line as one of the options. So I'm going to choose that and then go to type. And what you see here is a list of all the different kinds of functions we can add to try to fit the scatter plot. By fit, I mean that while no mathematical function will probably produce a graph that goes through every one of the data points exactly, the graph of a trend line will be the one that minimizes the total amount of error. So for example, if I select linear, click OK, I see a uh, what's called a line of best fit, or sometimes called a regression line. So this line doesn't seem to go through hardly any of the points exactly, but it is the best, closest approximation to a linear function that we can get to these data. It shows us the trend of the data. Any other linear function might hit one or two more of the points, but then miss some of the remaining points more badly, and thereby introducing more error. Now that I have my trend line created, I can go back and click on it. You see the line highlighted on the endpoints, and right click, and I see format trend line. That will just get me back to the menu I saw earlier. Under options, there's a button down here that will display the equation of the line that I'm looking at actually on the chart. I'll click that and hit OK, and there it is, y equals 938x plus 18,006. Now this is not something that we could do when we just connected the dots with a smooth curve earlier. I can tell from this uh, formula here, for example, that the slope of my line is 938. And in calculus, we learned that that slope gives us a sense of the rate at which the population is changing, uh, roughly 938 people per year in this case. Now there's another button if I go back and click on the line again and select Format Trend Line. It says display R squared value on the chart. Now R squared value is a concept from statistics and what it is basically is a number between 0 and 1 that tells us how good of a fit to the data is the trend line that we've chosen. The closer to 1 the R squared value is, the better the fit, and the closer to 0 the worse the fit. If I click on this and then click OK, I see an R squared value of 0 0.79062. That number doesn't have much meaning in and of itself. It's better seen in comparison with other R squared values for different functions. Now, speaking of different functions, pretty clearly this linear function doesn't seem like the best possible fit. Uh, for one thing, the population goes up and it goes down. It has maximum and minimum values. Uh, linear functions do not go up and down. Uh, they only do one or the other, of course. So I might want to choose a function instead of a linear function as my trend line. 
uh, a function that does have maximum and minimum points. For example, a polynomial of degree 3. Now I can go back, uh, click on my trend line, make sure it's highlighted, and format it. And I'm going to go back to type and select a different kind of function. Uh, I'm going to click on polynomial. And where you see order here, that's the same thing as degree. So uh, right now, if I move this down, you can see uh, we have a degree 2 polynomial here, a parabola. I would like a degree 3 polynomial, so I'll dial that up to 3 and click OK. I'm going to move this over here so we can see the uh, variables a little bit better. So immediately we get a cubic polynomial trend line, its formula up here, and the r squared value. You see the r squared is significantly higher than the linear trend line, so this is a much, much better fit. Uh, now I can play with this, by again, by clicking on the trend line, right-clicking to get the menu, and go back to format, and dial this order all the way up to 6 if I wanted to. That's how high Excel goes. And here I get a 6 degree polynomial. Its formula changed automatically, and the r squared value changes automatically as well. Now we see that the higher degree polynomials seem to be giving us a better fit, uh, but the expense is that we have a much more complicated formula to work with. Now the six degree polynomial here didn't seem to give us much better of a fit uh, than did the fourth degree polynomial. We'll go down and dial that back down to four. Pretty much the same R squared value and a much simpler formula to work with. So we might want to stick with the fourth degree polynomial. Now, of course, you notice that we can also choose to model data with logarithmic functions, power functions, or exponential functions. Which model we choose uh, really just depends on the shape of the data. If you have data that show an overall increase but with a leveling out effect, then you might want to consider, instead of using polynomials or lines, using logarithmic data, because that's what logarithmic functions do. Data that are growing or decaying exponentially, of course, you want to use an exponential trend line for those, and so on. Now I can do lots of interesting things with this model. I can use it, for example, to predict future values of the population. What would the population in 2010 be, for example? Well, of course we don't know any more than we know for certain what the temperature will be a week from tomorrow. But the model, like a weather forecast, let's just give a reasonable long-term prediction. The year 2010 is 140 years after 1870, so we can take this model and just plug in x equals 140 and get a prediction for the population in 2010. Now the population in 2000 was about 108,000 people, so this is pretty close uh, to uh, f of 140 here. But it seemed like the population was on the rise as well in 2000, so I would expect to see something higher than 92,000 people in the year 2010. So this estimate might not turn out to be entirely accurate. The model is correct, but like a weather forecast, it can give us bogus results uh, if we try to predict further out, too far out from the data we know. I can also get a good estimate using the model to the rate at which the population is changing. Now in calculus you learn that the instantaneous rate of change in a function is calculated by the derivative. Well here our model is just a simple fourth degree polynomial and we can compute its derivative quite easily using the power rule. And if I wanted to know the rate at which the population was changing in say 1980, which would be x equals 110 for us, I can just take my derivative and plug in x equals 110 and calculate. So this is the rate in people per year at which the population of South Bend is changing. It's losing 720 people per year in 1980. Is this accurate? Well, if we look back at the table of data, we see that the drop from 1970 to 1980 over a 10-year period was around 16,000 people. That's roughly 1,600 people per year. And the drop from 1980 to 1990 was about 4,000 people people over a 10-year period, or 400 people a year. So 720 seems like a pretty nice average between 1,600 and 400 people per year. So this seems about right. So you can see how spreadsheets can be useful in a calculus class. In the next screencast, we'll see how to actually do some calculations in calculus with spreadsheets. And this is particularly useful if you have to work with a function that is not given to you as a symbolic formula. We'll see you there.